go. All right, so last, last time we had class, we talked about uh, the children of the promised land. Okay, so they're getting ready to go into the promised land, and now who is going to lead them into the promised land? Moses has been leading them out of Egypt. No. Calm, calm down. Listen, listen, listen. See if you hear some names get r ruled out, okay? Moses has led them out of Egypt, and they have, they have gone out, and they were going to the promised land. Aaron has died. Aaron doesn't live anymore. And now Moses is getting ready to lead them in, but Moses did something that wasn't good. He hit the rock when he was supposed to speak to it, and he didn't honor God. And so now someone else is going to lead them into... Joshua, that's right. So we're, we have, we, we're with Joshua. He is going to take over. And Moses has died. And now Joshua, the son of Nun, is going to enter into, uh, lead the children of Israel into the promised land because the servant of God, Moses, has died. So he says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I said to Moses. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Listen again. Every place that the sole of your foot, point to the sole of your foot. You know where that is? Right there, the bottom of it. Okay, he says, Everywhere that the sole of your foot will touch, I, I have given to you, just like I told Moses. So what does that mean? What is God telling Joshua? Uh, no. Wait, wait, wait. No. Okay. Everywhere that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given to you. So what does that mean? Okay, so everywhere that they go, anywhere they go in the land, God said, you, this is for you. So anywhere that they go, right? Anywhere on the ground. That's right. That's where God has given you. He said, no man, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. God's telling Joshua, he said, I'm going to be with you all the days of your life. Always I will be with you. So what, does that, what should that give Joshua? God is with him. Huh? God is with him. God's with him. So what should that do to Joshua? Like, Joshua, faith. It should be what? I think you said it. Faith. faith. He should have faith in what? In God. Should, faith in God. He should be what? Strong. Strong and mighty. He shouldn't be scared, should he? Because if God's going to give it to you, he, should be, he shouldn't be what, Hensley? He shouldn't be? Um, defeated. Defeated. Okay, yeah, we'll take that. Uh, he shouldn't be scared. It says this, Be strong and of good courage, for this people you shall divide as inheritance in the land which I swore to my fathers. He says to him again, Only be strong and very courageous. And then he tells them again in verse 9, Have I not commanded you to be what? Have I not commanded you to be strong and no. uh, courageous? Y'all aren't listening at all, are you? He says, have I not told you? He, he kept telling them to be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Now, he, he tells them that three times. Now, if your mom and daddy tells you something three times, is it, are they serious? Yes. They're serious with the first one, aren't they? Yes. And then they get serious with the second one. And if they tell you three times, you best not forget it. So that's kind of what God's doing to Joshua. He's saying, don't forget this. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. And so they're going to go in to uh, the promised land, and there's going to be these people to stand up, and they're going to, they're going to kind of be in their way. But guess what? What's going to happen? They don't, they're going to be what? 
What are the children of Israel going to be when they face these people? How are they going to act? Scared? Strong and what? Courageous. Courageous. There we go. Man. All right, so if they're going to be strong and courageous, what about if those people are like giants? Isn't that what the spies said when the spies went into the promised land? They said the people are big and strong and we're like grasshoppers. God tells them to do what? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't be af- Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be scared. Be strong and courageous. For what? He says, every piece of land that your foot will touch, who gave to them? God. God. And so he said, they're, they're going to be strong and they're going to be mighty, mighty, but it doesn't matter. They're going to listen to you, and if they don't listen to you, God's on your side, just like he was with Moses on Moses' side. And... And, and if he's, with Mo, he's been with Moses, he's been with Joshua, you're going to be taken care of, right? Okay, so they, they're going to meet uh, a lady in the city of Jericho. Say Jericho. Jericho. Thank you, Brian. You're the only one that did it. They're going to a city of Jericho. Say Jericho. Jericho. Well, there you go. Jericho, there you go. You got it? All right, and God's going to have a, a, uh, someone in that city that he's going to take care of, and then God's also got a special way that he's going to take down that city that we'll find out. Thank you very much. Is this a songs for us to sing? No. All right. Now, why did God take care of the children of Israel? They were what? Strong and courageous. Yeah, they were supposed to be strong and courageous. Why did why why the children of Israel? Because he what he he loved them. That's right, and he was those were his chosen people. So he's gonna love them. All right, who does he love us today? How do we know that he loves us? Huh? He first loved us. Yeah. How did he show us his love? Jesus dying on the cross. Very good. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Are you ready? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They Bye. 
change people. Thank you for God in Jesus in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> First song this evening will be number 805.
Let us pray. Our God and our Father, Lord, we thank you so much for gathering us all here this evening to hear another portion of your word. Um, we thank you for all the many blessings you give us, the, the food, the shelter, the clothing, everything that you give us that we take for granted each and every day, Lord. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Um, we ask that you go with um, the speaker of the hour, let him have a ready recollection of the things he studied and have him to present it to us in a way that we may take it and apply it throughout our everyday lives. Uh, go with us throughout this week, help us to have a good week and to try each and every day to become a better Christian. And please forgive us of all of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, but it was good to be able to be uh, with them and visit with them, but it's, it's so good to be back at home. If you uh, would like to, you may turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, we'll be looking uh, at this chapter this evening. Uh, there, there won't be an overhead, so you can just turn to 2 Corinthians 4. Just leave your Bible right there. We won't be going very many other places, if any at all. Uh, but we're going to look at some things that Paul writes to the church at Corinth as words of encouragement. And uh, I hope that after we read them again to, to ourselves, it will be encouraging for us as well. In, uh, in verse 6, it says this, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. He begins, he begins in a few verses before this, but where we are here in verse 6 and 7, when he gets to verse 7, he talks about the treasure in earthen vessels. Now the treasure that he's talking about is, is talking about the gospel and, and the love of God, of how uh, Jesus uh, came to this earth and how he has revealed this to us and has shown us and that we may see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he talks about the, God, the treasure and he talkins, talks about this and likens us to earthen vessels. Now, we, we could talk about this being a vessel, uh, a pot, uh, a pan, a vessel it being something that is not necessarily extraordinary. You know, we, we oftentimes, we think about a big clay pot now for us in, in our culture and where we live. You know, that's something special because it, it's different. Uh, when we think about the Tupperware and the, uh, that Rubbermaid container we've had sweet tea in and made Kool-Aid out of, 
for the last 30 years. You know, that's, that's what we're talking about. It's just a vessel. It's just something that's there. And so what Paul is trying to tell them is that in us as earthly vessels, it's not so much the container that's important as it is the contents. Now, are we carrying around the treasure of Jesus Christ within us, or are we carrying around something else? Being enlightened and being shown the glory of God, we should be focused in carrying the contents of Jesus Christ and, and that special treasure, and not so much focused on the container of which the contents resides. You know, and that kind of goes against every marketing philosophy there is in the world today. You know, the marketing philosophy is, you know, we want to make a packaging that is bright and colorful and it grabs your attention. So when you walk through the aisles at the Piggly Wiggly and you go down to hometown, you see up on the shelf there and you're looking for a bag of chips, you're looking for a bag of chips that stands out and grabs your attention. And that's the, that's the thing that they're trying to do because what are they focused on? They're focused on the packaging to catch your eye that you may grab that. And then you grab it and then you may sometimes you may go to the contents of the container and you go, this, this contents isn't really what I want it to be. You know, this isn't as flavorful as I desired. And so you may be like me and there's a, uh, there's a store in, uh, on North Jefferson Street. It's a Hispanic store and they sell pork skins. Now, if you don't like pork skins, then... This makes no application to you. So, but if you do, you, you like me, you go there and they're in a gallon Ziploc bag. They're in a gallon Ziploc bag. They're not, they're not flashy. It's a gallon Ziploc bag. They don't even write what it is on the bag with a Sharpie. You just look through the bag and you see what it is. Now, if you want the ones that's spicy, well, you're going to get the one with the red flakes in it. If you want the ones that's not so spicy, you're going to get the ones with the black flakes in it. That packaging, that, that earthly vessel that them port skins are in is nothing to talk about. But what's on the inside will change your life. It's the best pig skins you're going to ever have and you're ever going to put it in your mouth. And it's great. But what, it, what matters is it's what's on the inside. It's what the container is holding. It's not so much the container itself. So when we talk about the treasure that is laid up within us as earthly vessels... We should be showing that contents to everyone. It's not about ourselves. That is the power of God. Now continuing on in verses 8 through 10, he says this, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. He says, hey, look, we're, we're pushed in. We're getting crowded. We're pushed in from the world outside in, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed. We're, we're kind of, you know, confused. We're, we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. You know, a lot of times we feel like we're isolated and abandoned, because of the persecution that we sometimes have to endure. But that's not the case. God has not forsaken us. He is still there with us. We're struck down. Sometimes we get hit by, with a blow that strikes us down and, and brings us to our knees. We, we feel you know, greatly discouraged. But he says this, when you're struck down, you're not destroyed. you still got fight left in you. you got a place to get up from. Always caring about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. We carry around his death through our suffering. Jesus' life is seen through us and the way that we live and the way that we handle suffering. People see our suffering and see our suffering for the glory of God and for Jesus, and that brings about glory to him. Sometimes we may look at a vessel, this earthly vessel, and we may say, well, that's not fit anymore. You may, you may have that old white, you know, that clear rubber-made container that you've been putting spaghetti in. It'll never be the same again. Once you put that spaghetti in there and you put that tomato sauce, it's forever going to be stained. And once you put it in the microwave for too long and you put it in the dishwasher and you get lit, too much of that hot water and it changes and it molds and it breaks, you know, hey, it's not the same. Did that mean it's not any good for anything? No. I mean, it's still good for something. It still can be used. It, it's crushed. It's, it's put down, but, you know, it's still useful. It can still be used for something. And, and, and I think about 
they, there's this Chinese proverb, this old Chinese story that, go, that talks about a broken vessel. And, and this lady, every day, she would carry the, these two vessels uh, on a stick, and she would go down to get water. And so as she went down to the water, and she would fill these containers up, one of them was cracked and busted. And, of course, as she carried these on these two sticks to and from and back home, she would get there, and one of them would be full of water, and the other would be only half full because of the crack that was within the vessel. And so as she does this, and as she carries on in this ritual every day, every other day as the water would last, and she would come back, she did this for two years, one pot being full and the other pot being half full. And so finally... You know, the, the pot, it's, it's an old ancient proverb, so the pot's got to have a chance to speak. So this pot that is cracked, it speaks up and says, why do you use me every day? I am of no use. I am of no good. I can't, I'm not as good as this vessel here that is full. You go and you fill me up and I'm only half full when I get back. I, why are you continuing to use me? And the lady said, well, have you looked upon the way, on the path that we go get water from? There are flowers on your side of the path, but on the other side of the path, there's no flowers. Because of you being cracked, you have watered the flowers that I planted on your side of the path. And without you being cracked, those flowers would have surely died. You know, sometimes that's the way we are. We're, we're cracked, and we don't see how we're useful anymore. We're, we're kind of put down, we're crushed in, and we're like, well, how am I of any use? I'm, I'm not as good as someone else, but you're good in your way. And, and you're always useful. You are, can always be used for something because of the treasure that you contain. And if we put this application of this cracked vessel within uh, the, the spiritual application of what he says with the treasure and us being earthly vessels... I kind of think this cracked vessel was doing more good because one of them was treasuring up the treasure inside of it and not letting it out, and the other was spreading it out all along the way. But we find out that Paul's suffering that he mentioned you know, at the very beginning of this letter in chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired even our lives. He has told these brethren at Corinth of all of the trouble and suffering that he has been enduring. He encourages them, although in this earthly body, to glorify God in all that they do and the way that they live their lives. In verse 11 it says this, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. You know, he brings forth this idea of the, how fragile life is. When he brings up the fact that our mortal flesh, that we, we are just temporary, that this body, this earthly vessel that we have, is only going to last for a little while. In verse 12, he says this, And so then death is working in us, but life in you. Death works in us for his glory. All the day long, while we, from the time that we are born, we really begin to die. You know, the, we will never be fresh newborn babies ever again than the day in which we enter this world. And so uh, throughout our lives, our, our changes that we go through, uh, our, our dying is, you know, only lifting up His living. You know, if we're able to carry uh, our daily dying, it brings benefit to Him and His glory. And if we, live all, if we let Him live in us, it brings forth joy and consolation to us in the way that we live. And, and so Paul is trying to encourage them that, hey, I, I know your life is temporary. And I know this life is fleeting fast. And I know you're just in mortal flesh. And one day you're going to go back to the dust that you once were and that you were created from. But all the days of your life, can you... Continue to glorify God and let others see Jesus living through you even though you yourself are dying. Verse 13 says this, And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I speak, we also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Back over in uh, chapter 6 and verse 14, he says, 
he, he uh, talks about this idea that, you know, the light and the darkness will be, or this is rather in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. He's going to raise us all up and present us to God. God raised up Jesus. And upon raising Jesus up, he has given us all of the promise that he will raise us up too. And Jesus has established his church and he is working to cleanse and purify and make whole this beautiful bride of Christ. So that when we get ready for that day, that we will be beautiful to be presented to the bridegroom in Jesus. And, and when we go before the Father and Jesus says, look at, at, at this that of my people. Look at, look at my people. Look at the ones who are Christians. When they go before the Father, they will be seen as pure and cleansed and whole and righteous. And while we're here on this earth, that's not the case. Our bodies are decaying. We, we have problems. We have issues. We have suffering along the way. We don't feel very beautiful. We don't feel very cleansed. We don't feel very you know, enlightened maybe because we're in our earthly vessel. And so Paul is encouraging these brethren at Corinth to look at the end, to look toward that day that is coming when we will be presented with Jesus, with all of the other brethren. We will be presented with Jesus as beautiful and cleansed and whole. And all of the things that, that were problems here on this earth, they are all done and they're passed away. They're no more. The, 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 there will be those who will be walking. There will be those who will be seeing for the first time. Those who are hearing for the first time. There will be those who are speaking for the first time as they are the beautiful bride of Christ, cleansed and acceptable. In spite of their imperfections here on this earth, they are beautiful unto God. In verse 15 he says this, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having been spread through many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. He talks about there's many who have experienced grace, who have experienced unmerited favor, Nothing that they have done of their own to be shown favor by God, but yet, nonetheless, they have it. They are, they, these things, Paul says, are done for your sakes, that the church may grow. And the more who experience the glory, even more enjoy the grace that God gives. This says, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Are we causing thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God by living through grace? Are we, uh, are we showing how thankful we are to God every day? By living, are we focused on our cracks and our imperfections as earthly vessels? In verse 16, he says this, Therefore, because of all these things, therefore, we do not lose heart. It's so easy to become discouraged and, and dismayed. And, and, uh, and thinking back to the, the children's class in Joshua chapter 1, God, God's trying to tell Joshua, hey, be strong and be of good courage. Be strong and courageous. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. And because of all these things that we have experienced here with the blood of Jesus Christ, he says, do not lose heart. We shouldn't lose heart. We shouldn't lose our focus. We shouldn't be discouraged. We shouldn't be dismayed. We shouldn't be afraid. It says this, Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And that's so true. And for some of us, that's more real than it is for others. That we see this earthly body slowly withering away. Problems that are coming. We see this outward man perishing, but the inward man being renewed day by day by the grace of God. And why is this done? For His glory. In verse 17 it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, this is something for each of us to think about and to keep this eternal perspective in things. And in this world, and the here and now, and especially in our society that is fast-paced, microwave, I want it, I want it now, I need it, I need it now, and we can get it, and we can get it now, and we get upset when something doesn't come next day or in two days like they said it would. 
because we're focused on the here and now in this, this mortal world and our mortal flesh. And Paul is trying to encourage not only these brethren at Corinth, but I think for us as well, that the things that we see with our own eyes here in this day and in this time are temporary. But we look for the things that are eternal. That should give us strength and that should give us hope to keep on keeping on, as it were. That we could do things for the glory of God. That we could share the grace of God to others for His glory. It is not for the glory of our own selves. That's how he begins this chapter in chapter 4. It is for the glory of Christ, not that of our own. I'm not doing it to elevate my own name. I'm not doing it to make myself look higher or mightier. But I'm doing it for the glory of God. Yeah, I'm broken. Yes, I have problems. Yes, I have things that happen in this world that cause a great deal of suffering. But I know this. What he mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9 when Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, are, are you here this evening and you have problems? We all have problems. The, pro the thing is, is where are you looking for the solution to your problems? Many times in this life, we, we look in the here and now. But the thing about looking in the here and now is all of the solutions, quote unquote, to those problems in this life, if we find those solutions in this life, they're also temporary. And they're perishing and they're fleeting fast, just as fast as we are. But when we look to the eternal hope that is found in Jesus Christ, we know that that is something that will sustain us, not just through this temporary life, but for all of eternity. And He shed that blood for any who would believe in Him. You can be washed in that blood. You can be raised up with Him in newness of life. And you can become a child of God even this very evening. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please come as we stand and as we sing. <clears throat>
Be with us now, Lord, as we separate. Go our own separate ways. Bring us back to the next point in time. Give us our sins in Christ's name. Got some sun, little fella. You can't get past me. You gotta be quicker than that.